Good morning, church. We're so glad you came to worship with us today. Here at Transformation Life Church, we are continuing to empower people to live the abundant life that God desires for us. Our mission is to discover truth, develop life-giving relationships, and do good. There's plenty of ways for you to get connected here at TLC. If you're new, we'd love to get to know you. So please, fill out a connect card if you're in person, or simply scan the QR code and connect with us online. Let's hear what's happening at TLC. How many of you grew up like I did, not rich? Don't be so happy about it. We borrowed for everything. Want a new couch? Go finance it. Want a new TV? Go finance it. We were just doing what was normal. People change their lives when they get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and they finally say, that's it, I've had it! This is a wealth building plan. It's not just a get out of debt plan. A budget is simply a plan for your money. You deal with the money stuff, and all of a sudden, you find freedom and connection everywhere. I feel like I can do more things than I ever could. You can go from where you are to where you want to be. You're free. You just got to get started. Please visit the TLC website or app to sign up for this event. Join us for an empowering and uplifting experience at the TLC Women's Retreat in Mount Bethel, Pennsylvania. Mark your calendars for October 6th through 8th as we continue together for a weekend filled with inspiration, connection, and growth. Please visit the TLC website or app to sign up for this event. Get ready for a fun-filled Sunday. Our annual service in the park is Sunday, September 10th at 10 a.m. at Woodland Park in Hasbrook Heights, followed by a picnic lunch at 12 noon. Stay as long as you want to eat, catch up with friends, and soak up the sun. See you there. We are excited to announce that we will be back to two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. starting September 17th. There are so many ways to get plugged into our church and serve the Lord. Stay up to date with all of our events and groups on the TLC app. Now, let's continue to worship. This world could never satisfy the longing in my soul when all is lost and all is dry. All I feel is cold I'm coming back to your presence I'm coming back to your presence Cause there's a hunger and a thirst I am desperate Immerse me Not anymore. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I feel a burning like a fire, stronger than before. You are the one that I desire. I couldn't ask for more. I'm coming back to your presence.
yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, Jesus, yes, Lord, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. (laughs) Jesus. I know there are needs here today. There are burdens that we've carried with us. Things that weigh heavy on our hearts. Things that maybe are consuming our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, our energy. Maybe you're in in a valley You're going through trials. Maybe you feel your back's against the wall. There seems no way out. I will trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Maybe the doctor's report has not been good. Maybe your bank account is not good. Maybe your job situation is not good. Maybe your family situation is not good. It seems like the earth around us is shaking, but I will put my trust in him alone. Regardless of the report, whose report will you believe? We believe the report of the Lord. Man has failed. Medicine has failed. God, we come to you today. We trust you. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Lord, would you bring help to us today? We cry out to you as we look to you, O God, for redemption, for salvation, for deliverance. God, we are desperate for you today. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to turn our eyes towards you, Lord. We will not be shaken. Though the earth around us be removed, (laughs) though it seems like everything has failed, Lord, you never fail. So we come, dear God, we ask for miracles today. We ask, oh God, for your presence and for your power to be evident in every life here. Lord, drive out the enemy and his work, oh God. Crush it, we pray. Raise up a banner, oh God, above your people. And God, in the course, we pray you would give us peace. You would give us joy. Help us, oh God, to to rest in who you are. You are faithful, you are good, and you do all things well. So God, we, we receive your blessing today. We receive, God, your help today. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, O oh God. There is none like you. We ask this in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ and his glory. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 6. Our children are dismissed. They can come right up here to the front doors and go with their teachers. Sadly, it's uh, the end of our series, Summer on the Lake. It seems like um, some have taken that literally, and uh, they're getting the last out of their summer. Um, But we know fall is coming soon. We're going to be gathering uh, in larger numbers before too long. But we're glad that you're here. So um, for those of you who haven't heard this, 
a number of times through the summer. Um, some of our pastors were in Israel uh, in March, and as we were in the region of Galilee and on the Sea of Galilee, and we were talking about uh, some of the things that were happening in church and the direction of our uh, preaching series for the summer, we thought, why not focus in on um, the Sea of Galilee, the region of Galilee, the ministry of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus in Galilee. And so we said, we're going to do the summer um, on the lake of Galilee. So that's where we are. And I think this is the last Sunday that we're doing this. We're going to move into uh, some uh, new season um, next week. But we are looking at um, John chapter 6, one of the most profound um, chapters in the Bible. Um, Jesus is going to basically preach a sermon, and um, we're going to hear that in this chapter. There are 71 verses, and we're going to read every one of them this morning. Um, and, and so just... Um, let's open our heart to hear what Jesus is preaching and teaching to the multitudes and kind of bring ourselves in here um, to this story as part of those who are hearing and receiving this message of great importance. Uh, we're going to talk about bread this morning. Um, and so uh, I have a few questions before we start. And um, maybe kind of give us a little bit of a better understanding of the context. So, um, bread, 71 verses, an entire chapter. Um, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, takes time to, to delve into and, and hear the whole message of Jesus regarding bread. First question, um, if you were to ask, where does food come from? Um, we can, we, we probably get a lot of mixed answers here, but, but say you would ask a child, where does food come from? Or if you're looking for just a simple answer, what would it be? Likely the store, shop, right? Stop and shop, Aldi's. That's where we get our food. They wouldn't typically go back to well, the farms and the fields and the rain and the sun and the farmers and the cattle ranchers and, and, and all of the, you know, to get it on my table. It's just a drive through and that's where we get our food. They just hand it to you through a window. Another question, what is the diet of New Jersey? I heard many, many years ago um, that a missionary shared this regarding, regarding New Jersey, that there are over 150 languages spoken in New Jersey every day. And I heard that about 30 years ago, so maybe it's increased from there. But that tells me that there's a lot of different cultures and nationalities, which gives us a lot of mix of food, doesn't it? Diet. So really it just depends on your mood if you live in New Jersey, what, what kind of food do we eat? If you want steak, you have steak. You want Italian, Chinese, Greek, Thai, hot dogs, hamburgers, Mexican. Whatever you desire, you can find it, and that's our diet. Another question, what happens to our food if there's a drought or a flood or disease or famine? What happens to our food in New Jersey? I heard a couple people say, the price goes up. You just pay more because it's got to be shipped further, somewhere else, more complicated, more expense, more demand, and so we pay more for food. But the answer never would be, we starve to death. Not in New Jersey. We just, in a little inconvenience, if these things affect the food supply. Another question, why do we work? <laughs> Some of you are asking that question. <laughs> I'm still not sure. A lot of you would, would just boil it down to, I work because I need and want money 
For what? Well, let's be honest. Now, you're being led down a path, so you know I'm looking for an answer. <laughs> but most of us aren't thinking that we're going to work to supply food. We go to work because we want a nice home, we want a better car, we want to live in the, in the better community, with a better school system, we want to send our children to a better college, we want to retire at an early age, and so we, we make the effort to work to do all these things, but typically it's not so that we can buy food, that's almost a given. Everybody has food. Now I know there are circumstances, even in New Jersey, even in this town and the towns around us, that you wouldn't think food is a problem. I know there are situations where it is, but generally speaking, I work because I want stuff, and I want more stuff, and better stuff. However, in the first century, where we find ourselves in John chapter 6, it said that over 85% of a person's income in Jesus' day went to buy food. So when they worked, they worked to eat. When they had a famine or a drought or disease, they starved to death. So bread and food was a very different commodity then than it is now. But we have all kinds of access and options, and we're going to narrow it down to bread this morning. And bread, of course, in the Bible speaks more of just literal bread. It's all nourishment and sustenance, um, but also bread. And for them, it was probably a very limited type of bread. Most places in the world are limited in their diet and bread. Um, but, but we have access. We have, we have a lot of bread. So you can go into the store and find aisles full of bread. You can go to restaurants that are named bread, like Panera. And you have all kinds of options of what kind. You want white bread, you want wheat bread, you want sourdough, you want pumpernickel, you want rye, you want seeded, you want unseeded, you want hot dog rolls, side split, top split, no sliced, hamburger rolls, onion rolls, kosher rolls, gluten-free bread, ciabatta, focaccia, Italian, French, naan, pita, olive bread, cheese bread, garlic bread, soda bread, corn bread. <laughs> There's more. We have access to bread. Christmas time, Germans, you have stolen. Anybody like that? Anybody know what it is? You're Italian, what's your Christmas bread? Panettone, right? I don't know what you do with that. You get it in a box. I've gotten boxes of panettone. I've never opened them. <laughs> There's a legend about, about that bread. Um, there, there are different stories about where it came from, but one of the legends that's pretty well known, and, and, a, and a lot believe it might be true, is that uh, it goes back to the 15th century in Italy, of course, in Milan, and there was uh, one of the royals, uh, Ludovico Il Moro. I'm German, and I think I did pretty good with that. And um, it was Christmas time, and he was having a big Christmas party celebration for all of the nobles. And um, they had this elaborate feast, and, and so they were, they were in this celebration, and it was time, or, or they were preparing the dessert, and the chef apparently forgot the dessert in the, in the ovens, and it burned, and now they're desperate. They have all these nobles and royals that are expecting dessert, and they didn't know what to do, and so one of the chef's helpers came up with a plan, and, and they just got all of whatever leftover ingredients they had, and they put together this dessert with um, 
eggs and butter and the cintron and, and the raisins, and they came up with this bread, and they presented this bread, this cake, for dessert to all of these royals and nobles. And uh, they waited to see and fear a little bit if it would be accepted and enjoyed. And so um, everyone loved it. And Ludovico Il Moro asked the chef, what is the name of this? And he said, it is Ipan del Tony. Tony was the name of the man, one of the helpers, <laughs> that told him, let's just throw all of this stuff together. And when the chef was asked, he said, Pan, pan is bread in Italian, right? Okay, something like that. Um, and so it, it's the bread of Tony. It's Tony's bread. And that's the legend of Italian bread, at least that type. Um, along the, the lines of Christmas, Bethlehem, where Jesus is born, is literally house of bread. So where Jesus is born is the house of bread, and we come to John chapter 6, which is going to speak now of Jesus, who is the bread of life. Beginning with verse 1, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick and Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? This is interesting, verse 6. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not be enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, I have, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number, so we, we understand that if they, they numbered the men, they counted the men, and, um, but there would typically be the women and the children as well. So this was far more than 5,000 in the crowd. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their full, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up, filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. Now, we've shown you some pictures throughout the summer of Capernaum, um, one of the small villages on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And this is where Jesus did um, and, and lived a, a majority of his ministry for those three-plus years. It was right in this, uh, this little village of Capernaum, right on the water, and so they came to Capernaum, and it was dark, and Jesus had not come to them. The sea began, uh, became rough because a strong wind was blowing, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. They were frightened, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid, and then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. So the other gospel writers, some of the other gospel writers give more details about the walking on water here, but John just keeps going because that's not John's point in this gospel. Verse 22, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw 
that there had been only one boat there, that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because the Father, because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. 
the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. The first thing we have here is the feeding of the 5,000, which is one of the great miracles recorded in the Gospels for us. Um, there are several things that are happening here, maybe happening here, um, but, but I think primarily we can just take away that this was setting up um, a visual for these people, a sign for these people. Uh, one, it was for his disciples. He was training them. This was, this was a profound moment for them. And, and it was hands-on training. As Jesus broke these five loaves of bread and the two fish, and the disciples took them and began to distribute them to thousands of people, and there was no end to it. Not only was there no end when everybody ate till they were full, but also Jesus says, now each of you take a basket and you go and pick up all the fragments. Interesting that there were um, just enough to fill a basket for each of the disciples and they all come back to Jesus carrying a basket full of provision. And I think Jesus in this moment is helping them to, to understand, because there's going to come a moment in their life, as there is in all of our lives, where we're going to have to rely on provision that God has given and the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God and the proof of who Jesus is that we can rely on him. And so I think each of them coming back, we're realizing, okay, <laughs> um, this, this is a moment, uh, something they probably wouldn't forget. We go from, from that visual um, to another moment for the disciples. And that's, we get on a boat, we're crossing over the sea, we're about three or four miles into this, if, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, sea of Galilee, we said, is 13 miles long and about seven miles wide. And so they're somewhere maybe right in the middle of this lake, and, and the, the storm kicks up, and there's great fear. Jesus walks out to them, gets in the boat. Um, no other narrative here, um, but they're on the other side in Capernaum now. Um, and, and the people uh, run around clamoring to find you. Where did he go? There's only one boat. Um, we didn't see him leave but he's not anywhere to be found. Other boats are coming from across the sea, Tiberias. And anyway, they, they, they target Capernaum again. It would be familiar that Jesus would be there. And so they get back to that town. And we have a few things that are happening here. And so I'm not going to read each section again. Hopefully you've retained um, the points that we're going to look at. The first is sign watchers, stuff seekers, and the works of God. What is a sign? We read in here a few times Jesus was doing this as a sign. Then we have the Jews that are saying, Jesus, show us a sign that we might believe who you are, that, that, um, th that we can trust what you're saying. And signs really um, in the Gospels and what Jesus did by way of miracles, feeding multitudes, raising the dead. These are signs that are validating his ministry, like healing a man paralytic lowered through the ceiling, uh, the roof, 
And, and Jesus says, okay, your sins are forgiven. And they're saying, Who, what right do you have to claim to be God? And so to validate his words, I am God, he says, okay, then just take up your bed, rise, you're healed, walk. And, and it was a moment where they're saying it's not just words without power, without validation. He's giving signs. But we need to understand that signs, uh, a, a sign is not the thing. It simply points to the thing. So I was a young boy. Um, on my mom's side, uh, my grandparents had two daughters. And uh, when I was growing up, we all lived in one three-family house in Queens. So my grandparents lived on the top floor. They chose that because they didn't want to hear a lot of little feet running around over their head all day. So they lived on, on the third floor. And our family lived on the second floor apartment. And my aunt and uncle and cousins lived on the first floor in a little studio apartment way back in the day. And so there were four children in each of our families. So we had six of us in little apartments, and we were very close family. And um, we lived there growing up until I went away. And my mom lived there all her life, and my grandparents lived upstairs all that. So this was our home, and um, it, it was a very, very emotional, sad, traumatic day when we learned that my cousins were all moving back home to my, my uncle's home um, in Ohio. And so we we're going to lose all our cousins that lived in the same house with us. We grew up with, went to the same church. We lived our lives. And so anyway, they, they moved to Ohio and... Um, which was okay as far as vacation went because vacation always was we went to Ohio or they came to Queens. So um, we got to see them a few times a year. But I remember I'm still a young boy and we would load up um, the car. We had a couple old big Chevys. The one I remember most was the Plymouth Fury 3. Anybody <laughs> remember that tank? Um, and so we would load up the family to drive to Ohio. And this was before Route 80 was really Route 80. It was, it was part highway and it was part a lot of side roads and then a little more highway and then through towns and lights. So today I think you could do it in about seven hours. Then it took about 12. And so four kids in the Plymouth, mom and dad. And, and thankfully it was the day before car seat. So we had free reign of the car. Remember that, old folks? So in the front bench seat, it was mom, a dad driving, mom, and my little sister in the middle. And in the back seat were three boys, my two older brothers and me, and we, we each got to pick a spot. So one would sleep on the floor, and so you'd have to put the pillows in because these are all real, real drives. Remember the big hump for the drive shaft in the middle? So you had to prop pillows so somebody could lay on the floor and somebody got to the seat, which was used my oldest brother. And then I typically got the back windshield ledge. So you'd be sleeping up on the, on the back windshield, which was a lot of fun when you stopped short and I got to roll down on my brothers on, on the floor. <laughs> Um, so this is how we travel to Ohio. Anyway, we're, we would drive home after a great time visiting with them. And I remember as a little boy seeing a sign that would say New York City. And I thought, thank God, we're almost there. Because 12 hours is a long time for a little kid. No video games, no Netflix, no nothing. You had a book and we played games. And so I saw the sign, New York City, this is, this is good, we're almost there. But that sign was in Ohio. <laughs> so when you got on Route 80, you had a choice. You go 80 west to California, or 80 east to New York City. And I thought, we're there, because I saw the sign. But that sign was only telling me there's a long way off to get to your destination. It wasn't the place, it wasn't the thing, but it pointed us there. And all of these signs that Jesus is doing is just so that we turn our attention in the right direction 
to see what is this about? Where are we going? What is the thing? The sign, the thing, John says in the first chapter, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this, this is the purpose of the sign, that we would see the glory of the Son of God, sent from heaven. So Jesus does this thing, and there's like this glory beam that is shining and it lands on the side of this mountain and a few loaves of bread and fish are multiplied. And the purpose of this is that we follow this ray of glory to Jesus and see him. But they didn't. Their eyes were fixated on, on where this beam landed. Look, we've got bread, we've got food, we've got provision. We've got something for our, our, our bellies, our flesh. And they never looked back to see where this was coming from. They, they never followed this back to the glory of Jesus who's being revealed to us. They were happy with the provision. They were fixated on the product. They didn't care much about the person. Jesus says in verse 26, truly, I truly say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now you'd think this is a good thing, right? It says that the people are seeking Jesus. Oh, praise God. We're seeking, we're seeking, we're seekers. We're, we're seeking, people are seeking, that's such a good thing. Jesus is angry. He says, you're seeking me for stuff. You're seeking me because I can give you something. You see me as useful, not precious. What can you get? from me. Not a treasure, not a God, not my Lord. What can you give me? Now, sometimes this is very blatant, and, and I'm, I'm not preaching on the corners of Patterson or Newark or the Bronx, preaching to an air-conditioned church with cushioned chairs and people dress right, and we sang songs, and, and we're all Christians and followers of Jesus, right? I hope so, but I think even in this setting, there are degrees of seeking wrongly. And some of us in here, let me change that, all of us in here are prone to seek wrongly. They wanted to make him a king. Jesus had to run and hide. They wanted a king. Verse 15, politics as usual. What do we want from our kings? We're coming up, believe it or not, God help us, on an election year. And all the politics are already starting. I mean, like full. We're going to hear all kinds of things. And we're going to have all kinds of division between this side and this side and that side. And, um, but it seems to all boil down to one thing. What will they do for me? What do I get from it? And so what do we hear? Promises. 
we can promise this, we can do this. And, and it's both sides. We just latch on to whatever thing I want. Well, I want this thing, so I'm going to vote that way. I want this thing, I'm going to vote that way. Whatever you can do for me, whatever use you are for me, you have my vote. I want you as my king. That's what they said. We're not interested in him as our God, as our Lord. He's useful. He'll give us stuff. They missed it. Jesus wants nothing to do with that kind of a disciple, and he's going to weed them out in this sermon. Jesus did not come into the world mainly to give bread, but to be bread. I am the bread of life. It would seem that God in his grace and mercy will sometimes pry bread out of our hands to help us recognize our need for real bread. Because we hold on to so much stuff that we think is satisfying. This is what I need. This is what I want. And, and so if I get all of this, I really have no need for this. If I get natural bread, I really don't have an interest or need for supernatural bread. I'm satisfied. And sometimes God needs to make us very dissatisfied. And he does that in a lot of ways. Some of you, some of you are dealing with it now. It's like you're being stripped of stuff. Things that you've held on to, things that, that have satisfied you, things that have given you comfort and control and, and, and you thought stability and peace in life. And some of those things God will take from us so that we recognize this bread. That, that's the contrast here, right? They're saying, well, well, look what Moses did. He gave us bread. Our ancestors, our forefathers, they survived for 40 years because Moses gave them bread. They had that. We want that, Jesus. Give us bread. Jesus says, yeah, Moses gave them bread. Where are those couple million people that walked through the wilderness eating manna? They're all dead. I give you bread that is life. God sometimes will take the bread out of our hands, this natural bread, so that we will trust him as the bread. Jesus didn't come to be useful. He came to be precious. He didn't come to assist us in meeting our, our natural carnal desires. Look, we had these desires before we met Christ, before we were uh, regenerated and redeemed and being sanctified. These passions and these desires and, and these pleasures. We, a lot of people, they, they come to God, they think, and, and God now, now, the reason I came here, and sadly this is the way we've made appeals from the pulpit. If you, if you come to Jesus, pray this prayer, Sign this card. Come to our church. If you come here, he'll help you get everything you want that you didn't get yet. You have your long list? Come. Jesus is going to give it. You, you need health? Come. Everybody's going to be healed. You need wealth? Sign on. Jesus is going to bless you and give you everything your carnal nature desires. And so we come to Jesus and say, Lord, now you are here to assist me in getting the things I want. That's, that's what John 6 is. But Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm, I've come into this world to change your carnal desires so that you're not longing after the things of this world, the things that are natural, the things that are perishing. We, 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 we take 
one of the one of the verses I I just heard some preacher. He he's often very dramatic in in his statements, but I think he's often very accurate. And he says half of what we believe as Christians are based on false teaching from Scripture. We, we latch on to a verse and we say, oh, this is what it means, and we build on that, and then we just run with it. Like Psalm 37. Delight yourself in the Lord. And what? Everybody knows that. Because it appeals to my carnal nature. What is it? We don't even know what delight, delight means. Delight yourself in the Lord. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm happy with you, God. I'm pleased. <laughs> if we walk in the house and the dog, I've got a little, little dog at home. Well, I don't have it. My family has it. I just tolerate it. <laughs> it's a good dog, though. I, I do... And it's an odd thing. People can come into the house and the dog just doesn't bother. Um, but when I come in the house, all of a sudden the dog gets really, runs back and forth, barks, excited, then runs, jumps on top of the recliner and just barks and barks. And if, and if I ignore the dog, just go in the kitchen, put my keys away, go, just, just all in a frenzy. It's annoying, really. <laughs> Until I go in, and I just pat the dog on the head. And I said, okay, Bella, Bella. Not a good German name, but <laughs> Bella. And, and all I got to do is a couple little pats, and then she, she's good. And then she just lays down, settles down, and we, I can go off and do my thing. Oh, good, good, good puppy. Love you, Bella. You're good. Aren't you happy? You're happy? You're pleased? I'm delighting in you. We, 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 give a, we give a pat. We give a nod. Oh, God, you're, you're, you're a good God. As long as you do, God. And so now that I've, I've appeased you and, and, and you, you realize how pleased I am with you, now you give me everything that my heart desires, right, God? This is how, this is how that psalm works, right, God? What David's saying there, the whole context of the psalm is David saying, all these evildoers have so much stuff. Why, why are they prospering? Why are they blessed, God? Why are we as your people going through such hardships? Read the psalms. David's, David's heart cry half the time is, God, have you abandoned me? Why, why am I so broken? Why do, the, why do the wicked prosper? And, and the whole message of it is, forget about the wicked and their prosperity and what appears to be blessing and favor. And so in the middle of this writing, this psalm that's telling us, forget about all of the stuff that looks like is so pleasurable, desirable, satisfying, but set your affections on me is what God's saying. Delight yourself in me. So how do we come up with, okay, if we do that, then we get all the stuff. That's what the whole psalm's saying, don't go after. Your stuff is yet to come. But we take that to mean we give a nod and a pat, and now we get all the stuff. What, what, what some, there, there may be some different opinions and interpretations, but I think in the context of that chapter, it seems more to me when it says God gives you the desires of your heart, it means that God is now changing your heart to desire the things of God. When the Holy Spirit is working in us, we're no longer attracted by the things of this world. We're no longer consumed and our affections aren't, aren't on, on the temporal and the earthly. But God begins to put us uh, in a place where our eyes are turned toward heaven and our longing and desire is for him. And so I'm no longer looking at what my neighbor has. I know what I have. 
And this is, this is where Jesus is, is going here to change the desires of the people that it's not that God is coming to, to give us and be useful so we can use him for our, our own end, but that we're looking at him as one who is precious, one who is my desire and longing. He comes to give life, verse 33. Life to the world, this bread. It's, it's two words that's used for life. One is bios, right, biology. It's biological life. And the other is zoe, it's spiritual life. He gives both. And so on that mountainside, he's giving bread, and they are surviving physically. It's physical, biological life. I've got bread, I can live but it didn't stop there. He's giving spiritual life. That's what he's talking about. Like the woman at the well. Jesus' encounter in John chapter 4. You're out here every day drawing water for your life. He says, I'll give you water. You'll never thirst again. For your spiritual life, eternal life. Verse 34, so, sir... Give us this bread always. Jesus gave manna. I'm sorry, Moses gave manna in the wilderness. Now you give us this bread. Four times Jesus says, I am the bread of life in these verses, this chapter. And then they began to grumble. They didn't like his answer. It happens a lot, doesn't it? We come to God, we seek him, we want to hear his voice, and he speaks to us. We say, well, I don't like that one. They have another option. They didn't like what he had to say. They grumbled. We know his parents. And that that wasn't even a neutral thing. This was a negative thing. A neutral thing would have been, Peter, we know your parents. Eh. John, James, Matthew, we know your parents. Eh, Some good, some bad. But Jesus, we know your parents. The story that your mother told about an angel visiting her, pregnant, out of wedlock. Uh, We've heard, we know, everybody's, you know, looking the other way. There's a lot of talk, the bastard child. We know your parents. We know your story. It's just not fitting here. Verse 43, New Living Translation says, stop complaining about what I said. Jesus is not happy with the conversation. This is a divine revelation that Jesus has given in this sermon. And the people took it to themselves to stand in judgment over him. How dare you speak like this, Jesus? We know your story. You're you're worse than any of us. And, And they assess him. And they evaluate him. They critique him. It's not how it works with God. And we sit around and we all talk about what we like about God, what we don't like. He should have done it this way. I don't believe it that way. It's not how it works. He assesses us. They wanted his provision, they didn't want his person. You do our bidding. We have no interest in bowing to you, Son of God. Verse 27, do not labor for the food that perishes, rather labor for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him him God the Father has set his seal. I thought this was a gift. And Jesus says, you're going to have to labor for this, but not the way we think. They said to him, "So, so what are the works of God? How do we labor for this? What do we have to do? That's typically the Christian or, or the, the, the average person's response. Okay, we're, we're supposed to come to God. We're going to do this. We get salvation. What do, I ha- what's, what do I have to do? What's the catch? And he says, here's what you have to do. Here's the work you need to do every day. Believe. Faith. He says, just, just believe in him whom he has sent. And sometimes that's the hardest work, isn't it? 
like to do things. We can manage things. We can come up with a plan. But when he says, don't do anything, just have faith, and then we start getting a little bit nervous. It's hard. But working for God never will make him precious to us. It will obligate him to us. God, I've done all of this. You owe me, don't you? A lot of years ago, probably about 35, I wasn't that old. I was 25, right around then. We had a board meeting at our church, which is out on Long Island. Um, see if I can get through this quick. Uh, I got a phone call after. Um, we were further out east on the island. I grew up on the border of Queens and Nassau County. My church was there. My parents pastored that church, planted that church. My grandparents were part of that church and, and an integral part of that church. My grandmother um, was, I think, the most godly woman um, on planet Earth. I watched her. Um, I saw things that nobody got to see. And I said, there is no other person in the world that loves Jesus like she does. And um, I got a phone call that night after a, a late evening and um, not too far from where we were at our church, my home church, they were having a meeting on that Tuesday night and my grandmother collapsed in the pew and they had to rush her to the hospital brain aneurysm, they had to do surgery, they didn't expect her to live, and we went through a couple of days of her just in intensive care, fighting for her life, and I remember standing one day in prayer at the back of the sanctuary, that side, and I remember standing, just standing a foot away from the ball, just staring at a white wall, praying, and I was getting mad. I was angry at God. I said, God, this is not right and it is not fair. If there's any person on this earth that deserves healing, it is my grandmother. If there's any person on this earth that has loved you more. And, and I was having it out and I can remember it, it was as clear as day God spoke to me. It might sound harsh, but it changed my thinking and my theology. And he spoke to my heart and he says, I owe her nothing. I didn't like that answer, but it's true. All that she was and all that she did, God still owed her nothing. And he owes me nothing and he owes you nothing. And all the works that you do, Jesus says, you can't work enough. All I ask, I demand, is believe me, faith in me, trust in me. I've done the work. You just trust. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Come everyone who's thirsty, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Why do you labor for things that don't satisfy? Listen diligently to me, God says. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. These two verses, two kinds of people are invited to come. Verse one, the needy, the thirsty, the poor, Everyone who thirsts, you have no money. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Come. Verse 2, you're not needy. You're not poor. You're self-sufficient. Why do you spend your money? You've got money, but you're spending it on things that don't satisfy. You have strength to work. You labor but you're frustrated, you're dissatisfied, you're, you're striving for things, you're grasping things, and nothing satisfies you. Jesus has come, so it covers both sides. You got nothing, come. You got everything, come. You need me. 
I think I have a quote up here, C.S. Lewis. I guess I have, I have time, and we'll get to the last point. I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. By the way, this is the first of seven I am's that John gives us in his gospel. I am the bread of life. He says, I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm uh, the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. All of these seven I am's. And, and they all go back to Exodus chapter 34 when God is confronting Moses and saying, okay, we're going to get, is it 34? Wherever it is, somewhere in there. And he says, well, who am I going to tell the people, who am I going to tell them? Or chapter, is it three? Exodus three. Who am I going to tell? Who sent me? And, and God's revealing himself, says, I am that I am. When Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, not only is he trying to make a picture here, give a sign and, and a sermon about bread, but he's also identifying himself as the God of Moses. The same God that spoke to him in a burning bush, the same God that led him through the wilderness and delivered the people. And Jesus is saying, I am. We don't have time to go into it all, but you can study it yourself if you don't trust me. And don't trust me. Go study it. Um, <laughs> It's Jesus saying, the I am of Exodus, that's me. I am the bread of life. Okay, so I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. and He did not intend to. That's John chapter 6. So we get to the end. There's a hard saying. Verse 51 to 58. In the middle of it, Jesus says, Whoever eats or feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Um, it, it goes on there, these couple verses. It's dramatic. It's shocking. It's confusing. What in the world is Jesus talking about? What does this mean? There are different interpretations. There are different church doctrines. Some are saying that this is, you know, communion, and you take it in, and it turns into blood and body, and, and different. there's all kinds of theologies around that. But let me, most of them are wrong. Um, but this, this is not an easy thing, but if I could maybe just, let's try to simplify it for the sake of a minute uh, oh, I'm in the negative now. Um, <laughs> only by a minute and 46 seconds. But we're done. What is, what is, what is this talking about? So, so today, uh, we're, we're leaving here. We're hungry. And we have to go get something to eat. We go to the diner. And you order the cheeseburger deluxe. Stay with me. Um, what, is, what is one thing we know about the meal that's on the plate in front of me? I, I know you're not going to get the answer. I'll give it to you. The one thing I know about everything on that plate, it's all dead. Everything on that plate died for me. A cow died for me. Wheat was plucked and crushed, died for me. An onion died for me. A potato died for me. Everything died for me. And every time I eat something, it has died for me. Even if you're a vegan, your bean sprout died for you. <laughs> God bless you vegans.
Here's the point. There's always a substitution. Either the cow dies or I die. Either that plant dies or I die. They understood this better than we do because when they needed to eat something, they had to kill it themselves. They plucked the plant and picked the vegetables and crushed the wheat and killed, slaughtered the animal. Everything I'm eating gave its life so that I could live. That's, I guess, the simple point of what Jesus is saying. I'm going to substitute my life and die for you so that you might live. Either he dies or we die. This was hard. They didn't understand it. They didn't like the message. And they started walking away. One by one, Jesus is left with his 12 looking around saying, where'd everybody go? And like what you said, Jesus, you ever been to a church you didn't like what they said? I hope so. I hope there are some things you're hearing this morning you don't like. Because that's really the whole message of the gospel. It goes against our nature. It goes against, you know, the, the, the God of the Bible is contrary to every idol that we've made up in our heads. And these are some hard things. So they left. Jesus looks at his disciples and said, don't you want to go too? That's that's a serious question. And some of us are going to face this, if you haven't already. If you're walking as a disciple of Christ, there are going to come moments in life where you're going to ask or be asked or or question in in your mind and heart, is this worth it? Do I, am I really going to follow this man? Am I really going to be a disciple? I mean, it's going to get hard. Not only is Jesus going to be teaching them and is teaching them as he's going through these stories that he's going to suffer and he's going to die, but he's telling his disciples, you're going to suffer and you're going to die. That's pretty hard. It's not much of what we hear being preached today in our churches. And we're going to have to come to terms with it, and we're going to have to make a decision. Don't you want to leave? Is this really worth it? There are a lot of easier ways. Broad street, easy path, and many take it. But Jesus gives some hard sayings and he brings us into some hard places. And those are moments where we really have to make the decision. (laughs) Peter says, where are we going to go, Jesus? We've been there. We know what that life's like. Um, You have the words of eternal life. And, and, it, and it says there, Peter says, um, we have believed and we have come to know you. See, that's where our problem is. When the, when the trials come and the hard sayings and the hard experiences, that's what it's going to come down to. I've come to know him. This is really hard. It's really hard. And some will turn if they went through this situation or had to deal with that thing. We've seen them. I know them. They've turned. They've left. But when you get to know Jesus and they're beginning to see him for who he is, so where are we going to go, Jesus? Jesus. There's no one like you. You have the words. 
and are our very life. Let's pray. Jesus. Lord, help us to see you for who you are. Help us to know you, O oh God, more deeply. Lord, forgive us. We've had a wrong understanding or opinion of who you are. We've simply come, we show up here, we live our lives um, basically just bringing you along for the ride when we need you, when you can be useful, when you can assist me in my agenda. Um, it's nice to have access. Lord, forgive us. You have called us to bow. To bow before your glory, your holiness, your deity, your sovereignty. Your desire for us is that we would desire you that you would be our satisfaction. That our eyes wouldn't be fixed on the things that you do or can give, but that our eyes would be fixed upon Jesus to see you in your glory. Lord, we... we desire, we're here. We desire, but we don't desire enough. That, that we are delighting in who you are. And so we ask that, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you change the affections of our heart that we no longer be drawn to the things of this world the attractions, that we would no longer think that, that, that what is temporal and earthly will ultimately satisfy my soul. God, we long for you. Change our heart. Jesus, we love you. We adore you. We worship you. We praise you. We humble ourselves and bow before your your godness, your deity. Lord, be precious to us. Jesus, help us to see you more clearly today. Jesus.
satisfy the longing in my soul when all is lost and hope is dry when all i feel is cold i'm coming back to your presence i'm coming back to your presence cause there's a I'm coming back to your prayer. 